Secretary of Health. We'll just welcome everybody to the 2021 AGM uh, of the Swift Country Watershed Stewards. Um, thank you to everybody who is here in attendance and online. I guess it's sort of the the norm for now is sort of this hybrid. I think we'll be heading into that. Um, my name is Kevin Stein, I'm the Executive Director of the Swift Current Creek Watershed Stewards. And I guess we'll, we're pleased today to have a speaker from the Native Prairie Speaker Series of uh, the Prairie Conservation Action Plan uh, to present to us uh, before our meeting. So just to give us some information about some of the work they do. I'll turn it over to Caitlin and she'll just introduce our speaker. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so my name is Caitlin Rose Seiler and I'm with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. Uh, we host a monthly Native Prairie Speaker Series about anything related to conservation or species at risk. And we do it um, either in person or online. And uh, this is, uh, I think, our third hybrid event. So it's pretty exciting. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. And I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Uh, so today, our speaker is Nick Cairns. Uh, Dr. Nick Cairns is an ecologist and conservation biologist based in Valmory, Saskatchewan. His focus is on the biology of the northern Great Plains, particularly the semi-arid regions, but he has worked in a variety of places on a diverse assemblage of taxa. Some projects include habitat use and overwintering conditions in small snakes, mitigation strategies for turtle, bycatch in inland fisheries, and the phylogenomics of frogs. Uh, so just before I pass it over to Nick, if you have any questions, we'll save it for the end of the presentation. And to our listeners online, you can just type your uh, question into the webinar dashboard at any time or send it by chat to the organizer. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Nick. Hi. Thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate it. Um, can, can you see my screen, Caitlin? Is that okay? Yes. All right. Um, so, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, my name is Nick Cairns, and today we're going to cover a bit of information about leopard frogs, uh, and we're going to cover quite a bit of other things. We're, we're going to cover some general amphibian information. Uh, it'll probably be, re be review for a lot of people, um, but we'll cover it anyways because it's interesting and it puts, puts some context to the situation that leopard frogs are in in this part of the world. Uh, then we'll cover the different species that call southwestern Saskatchewan home. Uh, and then we'll focus on the life history of northern leopard frogs. Uh, and finally, we'll cover some of their population declines in Western Canada, uh, conservation concerns and potential mitigations. So a little bit about me, just really quickly. My name is Nick Cairns, uh, and I am not originally from Southwestern Saskatchewan or Saskatchewan at all. I first came to, uh, to Grasslands National Park uh, and uh, I fell in love with the landscape. I'm originally from BC. Um, so I came the first time in 1999, uh, and then I moved to Manitoba when I was uh, for university, and I came back here every year, basically from 2004 onwards. Uh, and I moved here in 2009, and since then I've come and gone and done a few other degrees, um, but this has been my home. This is where where um, my family is. Um, I have worked on horned lizards uh, and snakes, as well as some frog work in the Southwest, some of it to do with parks, some of it as an independent researcher. Um, and I'm lucky enough to share this area with some fantastic people, including uh, my amazing wife and my two young herpetologists in training. Um, I just want to cover the word herpetologist or, because it's a kind of a weird word. Um, it's it's a weird word because it covers a really weird grouping. Reptiles and amphibians, which is what herpetology looks at, are not closely related in any way. Um, but Carlos Linnaeus, the person who gave us the sort of binomial nomenclature, the way that we use Latin names for species, uh, and started grouping a lot of species together, he didn't think particularly highly of reptiles and amphibians. He considered them just a groups of group of, of creeping things. And that's what herpetology means. It's the study of creeping things. Um, 
so it's nice for me because I get to use one term and I get to study a really broad assemblage of organisms. Um, but today we're going to talk solely about amphibians. So we'll put my reptile interests aside for a little bit and we're going to work our way to leopard frogs. So a little bit of amphibian 101. Uh, and again, I apologize for those of you that this is review for, um, but it is kind of a, um, an interesting thing. Can you see my, my uh, cursor there, Caitlin? If I turn on a laser pointer, perhaps it'll help. Can you see yeah, my laser pointer? See All yes. right. Um, so amphibians are an extremely diverse group. They have really ancient origins. Uh, but the current extant, so the, the, the species that live today, uh, really sort of fall out into three groups. Um, the first are the Sicilians, which are these guys. This isn't my photo. Um, I've never, I've never actually seen a Sicilian in real life. Um, but these are limbless, worm-like amphibians. Uh, they have paired little tentacles on their snouts between their eyes and their nostrils, um, and they live in many parts of the the tropical world, particularly in wet environments. Um, there's about 250, 260 species within this group. Um, salamanders are a larger group. A um, couple of examples here. This is a green salamander. This is a, a limestone climbing species of salamander. This one's from Kentucky. Uh, and this is a Red River water dog. This is a, a completely aquatic salamander from Alabama. Um, and salamanders in general have four legs and long tails. Um, they live all over the world in a, just a massive array of habitats. Some are diggers, like the ones we have here. Uh, some are climbers, like this green salamander. Uh, and some spend their whole lives, like this Red River water dog. Um, and there's about 400, 410 species of salamanders globally. The largest group of amphibians, bar none, is the frogs. Uh, there's about 5,000 species of frogs. Um, just a couple of examples of the diversity of them. This is a, a royo toad from California, a crawfish frog from Arkansas, and a copse gray tree frog from Manitoba. Um, as adults, these generally have four legs and lack a tail. Um, and as you would imagine, because I'm sure almost all of you can picture what a frog looks like, they often have large back legs that are adapted for jumping. They can live almost anywhere and occupy just a, a, an absolutely mind-boggling diversity of habitats from brackish water uh, to the tops of mountains to the tops of trees. Um, so when we're faced with such diversity, there's almost always going to be an exception. Um, so I'm going to give you a lot of facts today, a lot of information, and you're just going to always have to remember that there's probably an exception to every rule that I give you. So I'm going to say that amphibians lay eggs. Um, but there are some that give live birth, including some Sicilians that provide nutrients to their offspring in utero. Um, I'm going to say that that um, I'm going to talk a lot about free living aquatic stages like tadpoles. Um, but many species, including many frogs, bypass this stage entirely and hatch little tiny adults uh, from their eggs. So uh, generally, generally, mind you, um, they they have a life cycle that starts with an egg. So that's where we're going to start. So this is usually a fairly short stage. Uh, it lasts usually a couple of hours to a couple of weeks. Um, eggs are usually laid in a, in a variety of different habitats, but usually water. Um, that's it. There are many species of amphibians with terrestrial eggs, but they still usually use very wet areas. Um, all of our species locally lay their eggs in water. Um, and that's because water is extremely important to amphibians. Um, water easily permeates through their eggs. So you can see here, their eggs are really just a, a developing embryo surrounded by jelly, um, which makes them generally quite desiccation prone uh, compared to reptile and bird eggs. Water readily passes through that jelly um, and that makes them very sensitive to water conditions. So they're extremely sensitive, not just to desiccation, but to pH and to chemicals. Um, they're, they're very in tune with the environment around them because of that permeability of their eggs. Um, they also have quite a few mutualistic relationships. There are species of algae that live uh, mutualistically with them. So uh, one example is Ophelia abdostomus. Uh, that's an algae that uh, increases the oxygen content. So it grows on the egg jelly envelope or just inside the egg jelly envelope and it absorbs um, light and creates sugar for itself, but it also needs nitrogen. And so 
it makes oxygen as a byproduct, but the developing embryo makes nitrogen and carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And so they actually work really well together and it actually speeds up the egg development quite a bit. And as you would imagine, as a relatively helpless, easy to find, easy to capture prey source, they have lots of predators. So here's just an example. This is a, a, a leech feeding on wood frog eggs in Ontario. Um, if they are at a certain development stage, these ones are still too young. Um, if they are at a, a development stage enough where they can actually push through their jelly envelope, some of them may hatch prematurely in the face of predators. So they're not they're not like a chicken egg that has no defense against predation. If a, if a snake or a raccoon comes to eat a chicken egg, that chicken egg is doomed. Um, but with amphibians, because they have these sort of loose assemblages of, of eggs and their stages are not as, um, as helpless and they can kind of see and feel and chemically sense what's going on around them, uh, they can sometimes hatch early, which is a really neat thing for such an early developmental stage. So once they're done, they usually go into a free living life uh, larval stage. Uh, and in frogs, we call those tadpoles. And we're going to just talk about tadpoles for a second because they're a really, really interesting phase. Uh, and the reason I think they're so interesting is because they're so different from the adults. Um, this stage is all about getting food. There's no reproductive element involved in this. Um, it's all about getting food. And um, you need to eat as much as you possibly can. But you because they need to eat a lot, they often are herbivores because herbivores have more access to readily available food. Um, but this helps tadpoles eat different food in the same general areas as the adults. So they live in a slightly different habitat. Usually they're aquatic. Most adults are terrestrial. Um, but when you eat different foods from your adult phase, that's niche partitioning. Um, that means that the adults don't compete with the juveniles which means that you can fit more of the same species in the same area with limited resources. Um, this is also an extremely adaptable life stage. Almost everything can change about them, even after they've already developed into a tadpole. Uh, so some species, when they're running out of water or living is too crowded, they can switch to a, a carnivorous or cannibalistic lifestyle, uh, and they switch their morphology to match. And this is called plasticity. Um, others, like this Cope's gray tree frog here, um, they, uh, this reddish color you can see here, um, suggests that this species, this individual was raised in the presence of dragonfly larvae that might prove to be uh, predators of them, specifically darners or shinidae dragonflies. Um, and that, that redness is a, is a caudal lure to, to try and get the dragonfly larvae to strike at their tail instead of their more important head. Um, but these are little tiny swimming herbivores, and so they need to become hopping, climbing carnivores, and that requires a process uh, called metamorphosis. Um, and this is a process that drastically rearranges their entire bodies. Um, they go from gill breathing, limbless, often tail and beak having herbivores uh, that process huge quantities of algae and diatoms and, and gunk off the bottom. Uh, to lung breathing, tailless carnivores that move around and actively hunt for prey. Their mouths and their guts are completely rearranged, their eyes migrate, they grow legs, they reabsorb their tails. Um, and so it, it completely changes the way these organisms function. The other thing that tadpoles do that's completely different from frogs is mate. Frogs mate. Tadpoles are all about growing, but frogs are about making more frogs. And so um, I'm going to go back to amphibians as a in general here for a second um, and speak sort of uh, generally about them for a minute, because amphibians are generally small. And for the most part, they don't make huge distances. They, they usually stay relatively close to where they were born. Um, and so finding a uh, mate by happenstance can be relatively tricky. Um, but there are a, a number of ways that amphibians maximize their chances of finding another member of their own species. Um, the first is synchrony. Um, breeding activity in most amphibians is tied to major rain events or changes in temperature. This peak in activity maximizes the number of individuals that can be active at the same time, um, and so therefore maximizes the chance of, of interacting with one another. The second is chemical. 
Um, the skin of most amphibians, uh, just like their eggs, is extremely permeable to water. And so water-based uh, chemical signaling is, uh, is something that they use. They're extremely sensitive to chemicals. Um, and some of them have additional features to collect chemicals. So if you, uh, uh, I think you can probably see this. Uh, if you can see the little bumps hanging off the nose of this cave salamander. Um, now this cave salamander does not have lungs. So it's not spending a ton of time breathing deeply into its body. So it's not breathing a lot of chemical cues like we do through our nostrils and getting that chemical signaling through their noses. So they have these nasolabial grooves uh, that they use to pick up chemical signals. And amphibians emit just an absolutely massive quantity of chemical signals. They spread them around on land like this, like this terrestrial cave salamander would. Um, they spread them on each other. Um, they release them into the water and waft them towards other members of their own species. Um, they uh, will even inject them into one another. Um, so there's just a ton of chemical signaling going on. That's just completely oblivious. We're just completely oblivious to as humans because we we think our sense of smell is a really sort of sensitive thing, but it's we have nothing on a lot of these organisms. Um, the other tool that we're all sort of more familiar with is one that's almost specific to frogs. There is one salamander that does do some calling that we know of. There's probably others that we don't have a better idea of. Um, but that's but calling is extremely important to frogs. Um, it's It gives all sorts of information to other members of their species and, and to other species for that matter. Um, the first element of a frog call is the fact that each species has its own call, which means that if you're looking for a chorus of your own species, you should be able to find it based on the calls. The other element is it gives some um, measure of quality. Um, things like size of the organism, so usually it's males calling, um, the size of the male will vary the frequency that the male is calling at. And um, calling is very ex um, physiologically expensive. It takes a lot of effort to do to call like that. And so the strength and quality of the male can also be assessed by other males and by females um, when they listen to the call and say, listen to the rate of calling. So there's a lot of information packed into uh, what seemed to us just like a bunch of buzzes and trills and uh, growls and things. Um, so the next thing, once these calls and chemical signaling have been affected, is the process of making more amphibians. Um, and sometimes it's just a call that's needed. And sometimes it's more complex. Sometimes a female just likes a male's call. She approaches him and she grabs onto him in, or he grabs onto her in a clasp that's called amplexus. So this is amplexus, uh, where basically the male just piggybacks on the female. Um, and she may swim or hop or crawl around with him on her back for minutes, hours, or days. Um, however, in some species, it's more of a scramble to find a female and multiple males will try and dislodge uh, the currently amplexed male. At some point, that female is going to be happy with the suitor that is attached to her. This is a, these are Cajun chorus frogs in Louisiana and uh, peepers in Texas, and these are American toads in Ontario. Um, at some point, that female is going to be relatively happy with the male that is currently amplexed on her and she is going to lay her eggs and he is going to externally fertilize them. Generally amphibians um, spawn a lot like fish in that their eggs are fertilized externally but of course just like fish there are uh, exceptions and there is some internal fertilization in amphibians. Now I'm going to take a, a real hard left here for a second because there's a concept I want to mention before we get into spe specific species. And that concept is hydroperiod. It's, it's an incredibly important idea for amphibians, largely because of the breeding that we've already discussed. But to some extent, for some species, it also relates to overwintering. Hydroperiod is just basically how long water lasts in a particular water body. A short hydroperiod would drain or evaporate relatively quickly. Something like a puddle or a small ditch or like this little pool uh, south of Glentworth here. Um, a long hydroperiod has water more permanently. Think of something like a river or a lake. Um, 
different species favor different hydro periods. Uh, and I'll mention specifics as we're going through some of the species, but there's a lot of advantages to each. Temporary pools have many advantages. They are warm, so that facilitates fast development. They tend to be rain fed, so they don't have the predators that might live in a river um, or a more permanent pool, something like a lake. So there's no fish, there's no large insects, um, but they have low oxygen and they can often get a lot of salt and other minerals, um, as well as just you know, the combined amount of waste that, you know, thousands and thousands of amphibians might leave. Um, more permanent pools and rivers have kind of the opposite problem um, and therefore have the opposite advantages. And so species that use different habitats have different life histories to help them take advantage of these conditions and to minimize the risks associated with them. So, I was originally just going to cover the frogs in this little section, but because we only really have one one salamander, I thought I'd throw it in there too. So we're going to talk about all the species in southwestern Saskatchewan, including the tiger salamander. So the western tiger salamander. Um, this is a, this is a, our only salamander. Um, we'll start with the eggs because that's where the story kind of starts for most of these organisms. Uh, they tend to be laid in small clusters or singly, um, and the clutch size on these animals is not particularly huge, uh, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, usually a, a 120 per female would be a fairly large clutch size. The, uh, they hatch out into larvae that look like this. Um, they have large heads, big wispy gills uh, with three sort of gill uh, gill plumes, um, and they feed extensively on invertebrates and small vertebrates. These are tadpoles' worst nightmares, um, especially those that live in temporary pools. Um, they can develop quite quickly, but usually spend a couple of months in this larval phase. And so these larval ones usually don't have back legs, which is kind of the opposite of tadpoles. However, in areas that are cold or have particularly long hydro periods, uh, it may take two years for these to metamorph into a terrestrial adult, and some of them actually mature into a sexually mature uh, adult that looks a lot like the larvae, and they, we call those pedomorphs. Um, they retain their gills, and they actually get much larger than the terrestrial adults. I've found them in Alberta um, where they're 14 inches long, so they can get very, very large. Um, Around here, however, we don't have the hydro periods, just as I imagine almost all of you know. Uh, we don't have the hydro periods for uh, uh, an amphibian to spend its whole life in a pond. Um, and so they tend to turn into terrestrial adults relatively quickly in a couple of months. Um, the terrestrial adults um, can be quite handsome. There's quite a bit of variation in their colors. Uh, some are greenish black, some are brown, some have yellow spots. Um, they're usually quite large and the terrestrial adults can still reach a foot in total length. Um, and they have big heads, as you can see in this picture, and tend to be pretty um, talented predators, quite capable of eating almost anything they can fit in their mouths. Um, so the Western tiger salamander is found across the Southwest. Um, they're found throughout our area. Um, you'll see a bunch of these maps that I made. These are just point observations of the species in the area. Um, and they just give us an idea of where they would be found. It doesn't mean that they're not found in the, uh, in the areas that they're not recorded. It just means we don't have observations. So you'd have to take them and kind of imagine a, a, a polygon here. Um, this observ these observations all come from the Go Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, uh, and this accumulates uh, museum and government records along with citizen science reporting and puts it into a single data file that then you can use to get a reasonable estimate of where these species occur. Anyways, back to the tiger salamander. Um, they can use almost any habitat because they can have that variable hydro period, that variable metamorphosis rate. Um, they can occur in almost any habitat, modified or natural. You can find them in dugouts. You can find them sometimes in the river, although they tend to avoid areas with fish. Um, we used to have uh, terrestrial adults in our basement in our old house here in Valmarie. Um, and the reason they're in our basement is because this species spends most of its life underground. Um, they're quite capable diggers, um, but they'll also use burrows dug by other species like gophers and mice. 
Um, you'll see them on the road active uh, in the summer if it's if it's raining, um, but they actually breed quite early in the season, um, usually after the first major rainfall of the year. So once the days start getting sort of above zero consistently, that's when the tiger salamanders breed. Um, I've already had reports last week of them moving. Um, so in some areas when we had that, that warm spell before we had the cold spell before we had our current warm spell, uh, they were moving. Uh, basically any hydro period will do, but as I mentioned, they do tend to avoid predatory fish. Um, that said, hydro period, there is a limit to how quickly they can get out of the pond. Um, and so they are affected by drought, but this species lives quite a long time. So they can live 15, 16 years uh, in the wild. And there's records of them surpassing 25 years uh, in uh, zoos and things. So they, they, there's, there's a potential for them to live longer in the wild as well. Um, so they can often persist through multiple bad years in order to get back to good years. All right, let's talk about another species. Um, this is the plain spadefoot. This is one of my favorite species that we can find in this area, and it's an arid adapted species. Um, they lay their eggs in clumps in shallow water, uh, and compared to the uh, tiger salamander, they are far more productive in terms of per female egg numbers. So a clutch for a female could be 3,500 eggs. Um, as you can see here, they have relatively short wide tadpoles with with some very uh, interesting iridescence on a like a gray to purple body. Um, however, they're extremely plastic in their morphology and that sometimes includes coloration. Um, normally they eat algae and detritus, but this is a species that can develop into a carnivorous morph. Uh, and so when they turn into a carnivorous morph, they develop a larger head, a stronger mouth, and they capture and consume other tadpoles, including their own species and things like fairy shrimp that might be co-occurring in those uh, temporary ponds that they like to breed in. The adults are very toad-like, as you can see here, um, but they have a vertical pupil and they also have sort of uh, smooth-ish or slightly bumpy skin as opposed to really like continuously raised warts. Warts is in quotations there. Um, they have a spade on their hind foot, which is this little inset here is just showing the spade on the foot. And that allows them to dig into some surprisingly hard ground. I've seen them uh, digging in Manitoba into tamped uh, gravel roads. Um, they are nocturnal. You won't tend to see them. And they breed quite late uh, into the night. Uh, so usually they're kind of hard to survey for. Nope. Um, so they're found, oops, sorry, there we go. Um, as I mentioned, they're uh, fairly arid adapted and they specifically choose sites that have very short hydro periods. They wait for extreme heavy rains uh, and that to fill some of these ponds. And then they um, will move to ponds that are often in, in uh, dips in fields or in ditches or areas that tend not to retain the water for that long. To live with this, they develop extremely rapidly. Um, they can get out of the pond as fast as two weeks um, further south. In this area, it tends to be a little bit slower than that. Um, so they need really shallow pools. And historically, they would have used bison wallows, um, like not exclusively, but that was, an off, that was a regularly cited source uh, of, of these shallow pools that they prefer. Um, and when they're not breeding in these shallow pools, because their breeding season often only lasts a day or two, um, they'll go and dig themselves into a site. So soil type is really important. Um, so you can see in our area, they're found in a lot of areas, but interestingly, we don't really see them right around Valmarie very often. Um, I've never seen one in Valmarie and I've only got the one record uh, in Grasslands National Park in the West Block, uh, although they're much more common in the East Block. Oops. Um, so although they're really hard to record, um, we miss out on them a lot of the time because they breed so late. They breed when it's extremely wet, which makes it difficult to go into many places around here when it's wet. Um, and they breed really, uh, their, their conditions are very difficult to monitor them in. Uh, even if you're using auditory monitoring, it's hard to hear them when it's raining that hard. So another arid adapted species that can be found generally in our area 
is the Great Plains toad. And this is a true toad, so it's a bit different from the spadefoots. Um, one thing that you can tell if a, if a true toad has been in your area and laid eggs, they lay their eggs in strings. So instead of having little individual eggs that are sort of glommed on together in a clump, they lay in a long string with eggs inside this string of jelly. Um, and they actually have the largest clutch of eggs of any amphibian in Canada, with a single female being able to lay 20,000 or even 40,000 eggs, um, and bigger females lay more eggs. Um, toad larvae are generally fairly nondescript, small, dark tadpoles, but the Great Plains toad is actually quite light, and if you flip them over, they actually have reddish iridescent bellies, and unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it. Um, the adults are quite large, so they can be nearly four inches or 10 centimeters in, in body length. Um, and they, unlike the spade foot, which has a vertical pupil, um, they have a horizontal pupil, kind of like a goat. Um, and they have a big round body and, and they have these really pretty, I would say, um, nearly symmetrical dark green splotches that are usually ringed in yellow or cream color. Um, and they have multiple warts. They're a little bit hard to see in this individual because it's kind of inflated to try and scare me off. Um, but there's multiple warts in each of these dark blotches, um, and that's that'll become important in a second. They also have an extremely interesting insect-like trill. Oh, I didn't play the spade foot call. I will go back and play it for you because it's calls away. That's a Great Plains toad call. Oh, we'll go back and play this this plain spade foot. This one has kind of a duck snore. I forgot to mention that. Pardon me. Anyways, so that's the call of those two. So the the planes, uh, the plane spade foot has a duck like snore, and you might hear that if you're say driving a past McCord um, in the middle of the night, or if you're, uh, or but if you're driving up uh, through the Great Sand Hills, you might hear these Great Plains toads calling. And so, as I mentioned, this is another arid adapted species. Um, and so the habitat that these ones seek out is fairly similar to spadefoots, but in our area, it's even more extreme. In our area, they're really, really tightly associated with sand. Uh, so almost all the records in our area come from the Great Sand Hills, uh, but they can occur quite patchily. So there's no reason to assume they couldn't be found in some of the other sandy patches in our area. Uh, they need extremely heavy summer rain, just like the spadefoots, although even more so. Um, but once they're in breeding mode, um, they use a wider variety of water bodies, so they can take advantage of um, temporary pools and develop quite quickly. But they can also use fairly permanent water bodies as well, um, and they'll use surprisingly salty water bodies. Um, one thing that they don't like is spadefoots, because the spadefoots, as I've mentioned, will turn into uh, carnivores. Um, and so they tend to avoid spadefoots um, where they co-occur. So they'll they'll take advantage of more permanent water bodies than spadefoots. All right, the other toad that we have in this area um, is the Canadian toad. Uh, so it also lays egg strings and it also has horizontal pupils. And I, I forgot to mention on the last one, uh, they have a large singular wart on the backs of their necks, like on either side, and that's called the paratoid gland. Uh, that actually produces a milky uh, toxin out of it. So never lick a toad um, should you want to maintain your eyesight. Um, this particular individual in the picture is quite dirty, um, but you can see the pattern consists of much smaller dark blotches and they're less ringed in, uh, and, and sort of high contrast light colors. And inside those patches, there's usually only one to two warts per patch. Um, the tadpoles are far more typical of a traditional typical toad. Um, they're small, they're dark, they have clear, uh, clear tail fins, but the rest of it is just a small little dark um, tadpole shape. And they have an extremely loud explosive trill. Um, and this is much more typical of, of uh, crew toads or the Anaxurus, the bouffanted toads. Um, so yeah, just I'll turn this one on. I, I forgot to mention that some of these might be loud, so please turn your computers down if you've got your speakers way up.
So believe it or not, that's a short trail for a toad. Canadian toads trails usually are shorter than sort of six seconds. Um, but other species like American toads will trail for 19, 20 seconds. Um, and so you can see how that would be energetically expensive and a female might be able to choose a male based on that. Um, So these require slightly longer hydro periods. They usually take sort of one to two months to metamorph and they metamorph at a very small size, which is typical for toads. Um, but they do prefer water bodies with longer hydro periods. Um, however, when they are in these water bodies, which a bigger water body will be cooler by its nature, they tend to prefer to be in the warm shallows of these water bodies. Um, the adults also prefer a fairly wet environment. Uh, and so they use a wide range of open, moist habitats like wet prairies or marshes or near uh, like, um, little forested areas that are nearby breeding habitat. Um, so as you can see, they're they're nearly absent from the real far southwest of Al of um, Saskatchewan and southeast of Alberta. They don't really occur down here. Um, I'm actually really interested in these records because they're all quite old. Uh, I only have heard of one recent record in the sort of um, Kildare region. So they're not a particularly common species in the southwest, in the very far southwest, but up towards um, Swift Current and around, they might be more uh, visible. So just a quick uh, thing that makes it a little bit easier to tell these two apart. Um, until people have some significant experience identifying amphibians, it can be really tricky. And it's admittedly really tricky, even for people that are experts, especially when you have closely related species. And these two are in the same genus. Um, and toads are a really good example. They're relatively distinct from other frogs in an area with their dry, warty skin and their large paratoid glands. You can see this is the paratoid gland here, and this is the paratoid gland here. Um, but they can be pretty difficult to tell apart. So uh, one cr critical feature that's really helpful with toads is the um, cranial crest. And that's this bony process that I've circled in both of these on the top of their head. Uh, and they differ quite significantly in their, in their cranial crest. The Great Plains toad here, as you can kind of see, has a V-shaped cranial crest. Well, as the Canadian toad has sort of two parallel ridges that sort of, they regularly fuse into a single bony lump between the eyes. So it's just a, a, a little quick reference on telling them apart. I'm gonna do a couple more species and then we're on to our leopard frogs. Um, this is the smallest member of our amphibian community. Um, the boreal chorus frog is actually a terrestrial tree frog. Um, so they do have the little sticky pads that you typically would associate with a tree frog. Um, and uh, they're an early season breeder. You'll hear them right as we start to get some flooding. Um, and they lay their eggs on little, you know, in little clumps and they stick them to vegetation usually. Um, and as I mentioned, they're very small. These are, are, are definitely our smallest species in the area. The adults would only be sort of around an inch, two to 3.5 centimeters. And they have very short legs. It's kind of hard to see this individual's leg here, but um, they have quite short legs. They're not particularly athletic. Um, they are extremely variable in color. You get brown individuals, gray individuals, green individuals. They usually, however, have a dark stripe through their eye, um, and they usually have a white stripe along their lip. The tadpoles here circled in red um, are the only tadpole around here that has a lateral eye. Um, and this just means that the eye can be seen in profile from, uh, from the if you look at the tadpole from above, you'll see where the eye sort of adds to the profile. They'll see like little bulges sticking out of the head. Um, and if you compare this to the spade foot, you can see that the eyes are right on the side, whereas the spade foot, the eyes are sort of on the top. This is a spade foot tadpole. Uh, their tail is the musculature on the tail. So the, the sort of center tail part, not the fin, um, is bicolored, which means it's dark on the top and light on the bottom. And the tadpoles are actually larger than the um, than the adults, uh, and they may get up to almost two inches long, but they're still quite small compared to a lot of the tadpoles around here. Uh, they usually only take about uh, one and a half to three months to metamorph, and they'll use just use a quite a wide variety of habitats. Um, 
and they have a really cool slow trill that kind of sounds like you could imagine drawing your finger along like a plastic comb oops So I'm going to imagine that almost everybody has heard that call before. Um, they're a very common species in our area and they're extremely widespread. They're highly adaptable. They can breed in almost saline conditions um, and they can breed in just about any hydro period. I've seen them living in the same spots as spadefoots uh, and I regularly hear them calling from the edges of the river as well. Although again, most amphibians don't like breeding where there's fish. Um, but in our area, the sort of shorter hydro periods are more common because probably because short hydro periods are more common in the water bodies around here that don't have fish. Um, they can use a really huge diversity of terrestrial habitats, um, generally open or edge habitats. Um, you'll find them in, in your shed, you'll find them in garbage piles, you'll find them in uh, dense grass, you'll find them uh, next to the river, you'll find them out in the middle of the prairie, uh, basically anywhere. Um, their overwintering habitats are actually really interesting because these are freeze tolerant species. So they make their own antifreeze from the glycogen in their livers and they circulate that just as they're about to freeze so that their organs don't freeze. Um, despite the fact that they can freeze solid, uh, they do seem to prefer a stable environment like uh, underground, like, uh, like a rodent burrow or an ant mound. Uh, any place where they can find some stability because they are very tolerant of freezing, but what they're not tolerant of is freezing, then thawing, then freezing, then thawing. Because every time they do that, they have to use more glycogen from their livers and they run out of glycogen eventually and then they freeze. And we're finally on to the star of our show. Um, it's uh, It's an interesting species and we're going to spend the rest of the talk talking about it. Uh, and this is the leopard frog. So the leopard frog is what are considered uh, true frogs or ranids. Um, they're a huge group of globally distributed frogs. They're basically found on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. Um, and they are called true frogs largely because this is what people think of when they think of a frog. They have long legs for large jumps, they have big eyes and large mouths, they're usually semi-aquatic as adults. Um, North America has an absolute ton of ranid frogs, but the leopard frog is the only ranid in our area, largely probably because of the fact that most adults are semi-aquatic and we just don't have that many water bodies that would meet their needs. Um, they're fairly large frogs, so ranging from sort of five to 11 centimeters without the legs. So that's sort of, this is what we call the snout, snout to Euro style length. Um, and they're quite handsome. They have a really interesting variable base color. So they could be gray or brown or, or green. They're usually often presented as green, but there's a lot of diversity. There's also quite a bit of diversity in the darker spots. Um, usually though, there's some sort of circle a uh, rounded edged thing with a slightly lighter halo around them. Um, another element that you'll almost always find is this sort of dorsal lateral ridge, this ridge that runs down the side of its body. Uh, and it's it's not just a color. Um, it's usually cream or sort of yellowish colored, um, but it's not just a color. It's actually a raised ridge on the body, um, if you ever get a really close look at one. Uh, and if you flip them over, they're going to have almost pure white bellies. They have very soft white bellies. And uh, these species, uh, like a couple of the other species we've talked about, tend to call from the water. Usually the males will float near the surface, but sometimes they'll even call underwater. Uh, they use paired vocal sacs, which also separates them from the other species we've talked about. Um, and these sacs sort of come out of just above their shoulders. Uh, behind their their ear, which is this tympanum here is their ear. Um, and so these are the vocal sacs. There's one and there's the other. And uh, they use those to help make their call resonate. Um, interestingly, their call is not, it doesn't transmit very well for at least for a human ear. So you might miss this species if you're not right at the water body and you don't know what you're listening for. Um, but it's it's a, a really interesting complex call and um 
it's an interesting species because of the call. It, it tends to call night and day, even if most of the mating probably occurs at night. So it is a really nice species to go out and watch because you can see them doing a lot of their breeding activities in the daylight. The call itself is a low-pitched growl followed by some interesting clucking noises. But I'll play that. Um, well, I'll play that in one second. There's also a number of other calls. They have a release call uh, that's used by males and females to sort of ditch overly amorous males. Um, and they also have a startle call, which some of you might be familiar with. When they leap from danger, they'll give a like, like sort of noise as they're leaping off the shore. Um, and should you ever capture one, uh, they can also give a really unnerving scream, uh, not, not entirely dissimilar to a rabbit scream. So we'll just play, this is a breeding call. Yeah, so you can hear that growl and then the clucks. We'll listen, we'll listen to one more there. Growl. And there's your clucks. I, I have to thank, um, I have to thank the folks at Calgary Zoo for providing that call. And I should have mentioned before that the calls for the other species came from Nature North, which is a Manitoba um, herp atlas group. Uh, they have some really great um, information on amphibians there. So leopard frogs lay their eggs in masses. This is a freshly laid egg mass. Um, the jelly envelopes, the jelly on the outside of the eggs will actually swell up quite a bit more here. Um, and uh, they can be up to 6,500 eggs per female. So they lay quite a large clutch of eggs. Um, and often, they won't just lay one clutch. There'll often be multiple females laying multiple clutches in the same site. Um, and so that leads to yeah, absolute masses of eggs, like tons and tons and tons of eggs sometimes in the same site. Um, they're very dark. This is a melanin cap that helps protect them from UV and it also helps them warm up from the sun because they use slightly cooler um, pools uh, than some of the other species we're talking about because they like areas with a slightly longer hydro period. So you'll usually see them in ponds and oxbows associated with rivers uh, and spring melt as opposed to just rain is primarily the thing that keeps these types of water bodies alive. And so they're just generally cooler. So it's nice for these eggs to be able to warm up a bit. Part of the reason that they have such a long hydro period is because they have a really long growth phase for their tadpoles. They want to get as much food into their tadpoles as they possibly can. Um, and they have by far the largest tadpole of any of the species in the Southwest here. Um, the tadpoles can reach uh, 120 millimeters, uh, so 12 centimeters. Um, so that's bigger than four and a half inches, which is quite a bit bigger than, than any other tadpole we've talked about. Um, you can see from this picture too, they're quite streamlined. Um, they're strong swimmers and they're very alert. Sometimes you'll see them basking on top of the, the bottom of the pond or up near the surface. Uh, and as soon as you get anywhere close to the water, they'll disappear, which other, other tadpoles are quite alert, but this is a, a much more alert species. They live in areas where they can interact with fish, although they tend to try to avoid them. Uh, and so there's more predators in these types of habitats and they just have to be more alert for that reason. Uh, they take two to four months to metamorph. So you can see they can breed uh, anywhere in sort of April, May. Uh, around here in the most recent years that I've been watching them, usually late April, early May. Um, and if we don't freeze, then the eggs will hatch and uh, they'll continue to develop depending on the temperature of the water body they're in. And then they'll spend three to four months uh, as a tadpole um, before they metamorph into a quite a large um, juvenile frog. Um, so as you can imagine with these long hydro periods, they're quite inextricably linked to water. Um, but despite the fact that they're so tied to water, uh, they make substantial overland movements. Uh, they can move up to 800 meters in a day and they'll move 800 or sorry, they'll move eight kilometers between years. So they make very long overland movements. And um, what they're doing on these overland movements is just eating. Um, they're very adept eaters. All amphibians are, are, are pretty strong eaters generally. Um, 
and they prey on a wide variety of things, um, particularly beetles and spiders, things that would be frequenting water edges. Um, but they also small, uh, consume smaller vertebrates, like smaller frogs, like our, the leopard frogs, um, or their own species. Uh, and this is an observation we made last year, two years ago, um, of one eating a vole that was really interesting. Uh, so basically, once all the mating is done in the spring and the eating is done in the summer, they return to the water bodies uh, to overwinter. So they brumate or hibernate uh, underwater, which also makes them different from the other species and also sort of shows that clear tie they have to the water. Um, but they need water bodies that don't freeze to the bottom and preferably have high oxygen because they sit on the bottom quite exposed and get all their oxygen content that they need from the water. And so they need areas that are consistently have water and probably are almost always rivers in our area. Um, so we actually have a pretty good idea of where leopard frogs occur in the Southwest. They're large, they make a lot of noise, uh, and they're fairly obvious for people that are familiar with them. I think anyone that's ever walked near uh, the river or walked near uh, a dugout is going to have seen a leopard frog. And so we have pretty good records for them. Um, you'll see them in a huge diversity of habitats, uh, both natural and man-made. And they're quite capable of colonizing habitats um, given their ability to travel over land. However, uh, in order to persist, they need warm, preferably fishless water to breed in and cold, preferably limited fish activity water with lots of oxygen to overwinter in. Uh, and that means that they're tied to permanent water. And this complicates their life history, especially in our area, um, because water is not that permanent here. Um, and that leads to a, a real diversity of risks. So we're going to talk about the risks now for a little bit. And there are many threats um, to this species, um, largely tied to that natural history that we've talked about. Um, some of them are natural and some of them are unnatural that would cause uh, issues for any aquatic amphibian. Uh, so for example, uh, increases in pH or uh, changes in pH or increases in salt content due to pond drying, so droughts can cause real risk. Uh, contaminants like PCBs, uh, fertilizer like ammonium nitrate, uh, herbicides like glyphosate, or if we were in an area with more corn, atrazine, um, can cause larval and adult mortality. Um, beyond this, they're subject to some fairly major global patterns that, that humans might not have direct control on right now. Um, changes in temperature and precipitation that we're observing uh, are definitely affecting some of these species. Um, so for example, these are some maps from Polly et al. 2013. These aren't papers that I wrote, but I think they really in, uh, show the importance of snow cover. Um, this is the percent of snow cover uh, on days in March. So it's, it's, a, it's just giving you an idea of how much snow is still there in the spring. Um, and this is the map from 1971, and this is a map from 2008. And you can see in our region, there's a lot less snow uh, than there was in the 70s. Uh, in fact, overall, there's about 9 million square kilometers less snow in 2008 than there was in 1971. Uh, and much of that missing snow is coming from that sort of arid steppe that we're uh, semi-arid steppe habitat that's found in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana. And a lot of this lack of water that we're seeing is exacerbated by human management. So things like channelizing uh, that you see sort of closer to brooks in Alberta, uh, or controlling flow rates, which are really common here. So for example, in Valmarie, uh, the Frenchman goes through four dams. Um, and the the with the droughts that we've been experiencing, we haven't had a full flood in the Frenchman for two years. So none of the oxbows that we have that the leopard frogs usually breed in have filled for the last two years. So if you consider that this animal only lives for five years, that can be a major impact. Similarly, um, in order to sort of make a predictable outflow, uh, a lot of dams release uh, flooding at sort of a half bank or, or a full bank, but not allowing the, the bank to overflow. Uh, and that actually carves more um, 
sediment into the water, it carves out uh, cut banks and things more than just allowing the river to flood naturally. Um, and so that adds a lot of sediment and reduces um, water quality, things like oxygen and stuff in those rivers. So that can have major effects on recruitment. And if you do that for too many years in a row, you can that can lead to local extirpations. Presumably, I, I can't uh, I can't say that it definitely has because we don't have the baseline numbers for that. Some of the other threats that this species faces are things like fragmentation, which almost every species in the human dominated world faces. Um, there's lots of habitat con con conversion and um, lots of their habitat has been cut up by roads and, and roads are, are a massive impact. We see them get hit on the roads all the time. Amphibians are always getting hit on the roads. But with leopard frogs, because they're so terrestrial at some times of the year, thousands and thousands of them can be hit at the same, on the same night. And that's there's just no way for uh, to recreate that naturally. There's no way any predator could obliterate that many frogs in one night. So although they're very uh, resilient to predation and and losses of at different life stages, there's no way that we can mimic the amount of frogs that get killed on roads. Not so much here. There's other risks like invasive species. Um, in particular, in Montana and British Columbia, the introduction of bullfrogs has caused some um, populations to decline or disappear. Uh, similarly, uh, the stocking of trout in places that didn't naturally have trout has led to the loss of local populations as well. One of the largest risks, probably, for this species um, comes from more frog-specific threats. Um, there's a really interesting pattern in leopard frogs across North America and, and other species as well is a really odd pattern of malformations where the frogs grow additional limbs. So instead of having two hind legs and two front legs, they might have three hind legs. Um, and this appears to be tied to a type of parasitic infection that's caused from a trematode or a fluke. Um, and that by itself is probably natural, but um, prevalence of that fluke uh, as well as things like lungworms have been tied to immunosuppression from different herbicides. Um, and so, although it's a natural occurring parasite of the species, the frog's ability to fight off the parasite has been uh, um, hampered by uh, immunosuppression. Um, there's also a variety of viruses, um, particularly ranaviruses, that can cause major local die-offs. Um, and we as humans, including uh, maybe especially as biologists, uh, have been implicated in, in the transmission of these types of diseases because we move in and out of different ponds and maybe we don't do a good enough job of cleaning our gear. Um, so one example of this that's actually worse than just the baseline ranaviruses that have sort of long been in this area. Um, in the 1970s, a pandemic began for frogs globally. Um, this was a chytrid fungus, so it's a skin fungus, and it's estimated to have affected 30% uh, of all amphibian species in the world. Uh, and it's been implicated in the extinction of up to 200 species globally. Um, we know it does have some effect on leopard frogs, um, and we found populations, I haven't personally, uh, but we, there are populations where you find this sort of telltale red legs um, that suggests that a fungus has been eating at their skin and, and it kills them. However, chytrid doesn't affect things like tadpoles or fish or turtles. It only affects the adult frogs. If there's a die off of, of those other organisms, it's likely a ranavirus. And so unfortunately, all of this has led to declines. We don't know the exact cause for the declines, but there's been range-wide declines in the leopard frog, as well as local extirpations from really large parts of their range, particularly in Western North America. You can see this lighter red color here is all areas that used to have native leopard frogs and no longer do. And here's a sort of a closer look at the Alberta example. So this is from pre-2000. This is where leopard frogs were found based on surveys. And this is post-2000, well, up until 2006 surveys. Uh, you can see they've really declined from the center of the province and from the foothills. So there's a large number of groups that have, have come to uh, the realization that this is, this is apparently quite a, a serious um, 
declined. There's large parts of the range that have gone missing. And so to counter this, some groups like the Calgary Zoo uh, and Parks Canada have begun reintroduction programs in their respective uh, regions. Um, so um, in some of the national parks in Alberta and in some uh, areas in BC, leopard frogs have been reintroduced uh, in areas that have hopefully not got uh, the risk factors that were associated historically with them in those areas. Um, and many groups, even outside of those sort of classic conservation groups, are seeing the real value of monitoring. Um, the leopard frog is not the only species that has experienced declines in the last 40, 40 years. Um, and part of the interest with leopard frogs is that they were so common and the declines were so noticeable um, that they, they drew real attention quite quickly, whereas other species um, could disappear without us even knowing. Um, so getting a baseline of the distribution and seasonality and activity patterns of leopard frogs and other frogs can help understand population health and trajectory. Um, sometimes this is done by trained researchers with remote listening devices that'll give you really cool things like this. There's the growl and there's the clucks. Um, but the most useful data I think that's coming out of sort of the modern technological version of, of wildlife monitoring is the publicly sourced data from citizen scientists. Um, having just anybody go out and listen for local frogs and then reporting the date, and the time, where they were calling from is extremely useful. Um, and so people that are interested in that uh, can go and participate in a wide variety of these programs. Um, there's some that have specific methods they want you to follow, things like Frog Watch. Um, there's some that you just take a picture of a frog and, and you can submit it and people will identify it for you. And then that record gets uploaded into databases like the ones I use to make those maps. Um, and you can submit that data um, without really any effort. Um, the important thing to do is if people do want to go out and monitor frogs to make sure you clean your gear um, and make sure you're not spreading anything because we don't want to lead to any further declines. It's really important. Uh, and then the other thing is to try and get some documentation of your observation because it's really great to know that you heard a frog calling, but it's really, really great to have that frog call or a picture of the frog calling. So with that, thank you everybody for um, all your interest and, and for listening to such a long talk. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you uh, if you would like. First of all, thank you so much, Nick, for the presentation. Um, does anyone here in the room have any questions for Nick? Yeah, I don't see anything from anyone online. If any of our attendees online have any questions, feel free to type it into the question section. Oh, yes, one in the back here. Go ahead. I uh, just one I didn't have an answer already, but it's a great presentation there. Uh, how could the uh, effects of the, the, the decline population, what can we do to mitigate that as just uh, the farms and other things that are largely impacted? Um, I don't know if you heard that, Nick, but what can we do to mitigate declining populations? Um. A lot of the mitigations that I've heard of are really more just habitat mitigations, protecting water bodies that might be subject to an invasive species or protecting them from uh, having people walk in them or spread um, diseases to them. A lot of it is just having people step back in my mind. Um, there are some that are really active, like the stuff that the Calgary Zoo is doing, um, getting, uh, getting lots of people out there and actually reintroducing frogs. We're lucky in our area that we haven't lost our frogs. And in fact, um, our, some of our frogs in West, southwestern Saskatchewan have been used as source stock to um, put in other populations that have declined to uh, extirpation. So um, I, I'm not sure if that entirely answers your question because I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not entirely up to uh, which the, the, the diversity of the mitigations that are available, but uh, generally, from my experience, the best thing we can do is remove uh, as much human disturbance from the situation as we can. Thank you for that answer. I think that that answers it. Um, I think we've got a question from a listener here. Uh, can you speak to mud puppy? um in southwest saskatchewan is it here did i see one in my pond this past summer and this is from a listener named uh, stacy yeah so 
we often, like I often get reports of mud puppies from people. Um, the true mud puppies, um, there's, there's a group of, of uh, amphibians, the salamanders called mud puppies. They're in the genus Necturus. Um, they occur in Manitoba, Ontario, basically sort of Mississippi and East for the most part. Um, what we have here that we often call mud puppies and, and I do the same thing, I'm guilty of it as well. Those are actually larval tiger salamanders. So okay. once, 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 once tiger salamanders get to the stage where they're quite large, but they still have the gills, um, we still sometimes call those mud puppies, although technically there's an actual group called the mud puppies. Okay, so they're actually tiger salamander larvae. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and in some places, if you were in the foothills, um, they might be adult tiger salamanders, um, but they've just, they're just um, um, neotenic. So they, they retain their juvenile characteristics, but they're sexually mature. And they're carnivorous, like they will be eating fish in the pond? Well, they'll eat small fish, they'll eat crayfish, they'll eat tadpoles, they'll eat adult frogs, uh, they'll eat anything. I mean, the, the mud puppies, like the mud puppy, the Necturus, in, it, you often catch them when you when you're ice fishing out east. So yeah, they'll they'll eat pretty much anything. They're very chemically sensitive, so they'll chemical and and, and movements. They'll they'll be drawn to it. And I've seen them eat crayfish. So yeah, they're they're quite capable predators. Cool, that's really neat. Thank you. Um, and Stacy, the listener, writes in thank you as well. Um, and a, another question from here. Go ahead. There was one species you mentioned something about if you want to keep your eyesight. Uh, you made a comment about that. Uh, do you remember, did I hear that right? Is there, something? Um, there was a species that you mentioned, um, something about if you want to keep your eyesight. Oh, I think <laughs> yes. you don't lick a, uh, a toad. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, true, the true toads, the bufonids, uh, those ones with the paratoid glands, if you, if you agitate them, um, they, they'll, they'll exude this sort of white milky toxin from those glands on their neck. Uh, and our species aren't particularly toxic, um, but they're definitely toxic enough uh, to affect uh, a human. And um, one of the first effects that they have is reducing your, your the functionality of your eyes. Um, and so often uh, in places where some of the more toxic species occur, people's dogs will go blind or people will go blind thinking they're being funny and they lick a toad. Um, so it's not unheard of, but in this area, I've, I've not actually heard of it. Is it permanent? And is it permanent? Not in all species. I, I know of one friend of mine who did it and he lost his eyesight for two days. Two days. Okay. Yeah, that was a, that was a species that doesn't occur here though. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I, would, I would test it though. Don't test it. Nobody test it. I didn't Let's I do not it, yeah. sanction <laughs> testing. <laughs> Toad licking. <laughs> Cool. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have. Anyone else in the room here? No, I don't think so. And there's no other questions coming in online. So um, thank you so much, Nick, for the awesome presentation and, and teaching us all about amphibians. And yeah, it was pretty amazing. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I'll talk to you later then. Have a great rest of your day, Nick. Thanks. You too. So I will pass it over to Kevin to start the AGM part of the of the day. And I should mention to all of our listeners, there is a annual report in the handout section. Do you want anything up here? I don't know if you've got it. I guess if there's questions, yeah. you can either just put it in the chat and then you can check. So okay. Sure. Um, so to our attendees there, we'll be starting with the AGM part. If you have any questions at any time, just type it into the question section and we will moderate them for you. Yeah, I have to make a motion to approve the agenda. How well can people hear us who are online? 
guess that's a question that I've got. There's no comments. I'm going to assume that everyone can hear okay. Otherwise, we will move closer. <laughs> okay, all good. I'll make a motion. Maybe you two will have to switch spots because you're quieter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can't get loud. That right in front of you. Wanted to go over the minutes. Yeah. Uh, we also see we, the minutes were sort of some. It's circulated, but I can just touch on. The yeah, meeting. we'll get Kevin to touch on the. Right. So, so this the last meeting, um, our lot, the 2020 ADM of the Watershed Stewards was held uh, March 4th, 2021, at the Houston Pizza, and virtually via Zoom. It started with a presentation made to longtime retiring board member Dan Runcie. Um, on the Darren Dib chairperson's report, just thanking Kevin and Dallas for their work during during COVID. Thanked our outgoing board members, uh, Dan Runcie, Garrett Thinnis, Danny Spence, and Bruce Day, and welcome new board members, Stacey Weems, Brent Michelson, Pat Friesen, and welcome Don Matthews back to the board. Um, I gave the executive director report. Um, we pivoted due to COVID, which everybody else in the world is trying to do. Um, so we were able to continue to work outside um, with some of our projects in, in 2020. The phosphorus testing, the Herbert Water Use Plan, and, and Aquatic Invasive Species Monitoring. Our frog hoppers program was limited due to school and camp closings worked with the Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards to hire an intern to help them create a curriculum similar to frog hoppers and revamp the frog hoppers curriculum. Um, so we had received funding to create constructed wetlands on flood irrigation lots in the Waldeck irrigation projects um, and doing some bits and uh, working with WSP to design and construct and I've been working from home for almost a year at that time. We're heading on to two years now. Um, Dallas Peters gave the environmental, uh, the agri environmental technician report. Um, a lot of her um, was able to do applications. Um, remote working remotely with producers uh, as could come in, we could come to the office or visit to. Visits were limited due to COVID. Um, we produced mail outs to on Canadian Agriculture Partnership um, for farm boxes and advertised in local papers. Um, Bertie Lemire gave the Saskatchewan Association of Watershed Reports. Uh, SAW was contracted to develop educational material on drainage and climate change um, and working on. Uh, water management demonstration sites and saw has contracted a consultant to draft a long-term business plan for itself in the watershed stewardship groups. Moved by Stacy, seconded by Jolene to accept the reports as presented. That was carried. Uh, Kevin gave reports on projects that were worked on in 2020. Um, so I don't know if there's anything really there um, that. So this here. So Kevin uh, presented the financial state or moved by John, second by Pat to accept project reports as presented. It was carried from the financial statement. Um, income was for the year which ended November 30th, 30th 2020, 
The income was $245,000 with expenses of $193,286. Uh, the reason for the large surplus was that the first payment of $46,744 for the constructed wetland projects was received in November and all the expenses will not be paid out until March and significant adjustments made as it was the first time that Start to Marsh completed the financial statements. Moved by Frank, uh, seconded by Don to adopt the financial statement as presented, carried, and then moved by Stacy, seconded by Jolene to adopt Start to Marsh CPA LLP as auditors for the 2020-2021 one year. Carried, Stacy moved to adjourn. Thanks, Kevin. I get a motion to uh, adopt the minutes. We got that motion. Uh, Bernie seconds. Okay. All in favor? It's passed. It's carried. Yeah. Do you or uh, Caitlin? Do you know where if there's show up on there or search for it on the screen if there's questions? Mm -hmm. Just in case we get some questions. All right. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. Okay, I guess we'll move on to our reports for this year. And I'll start us off. Find it here. Okay, I'm Darren Fiddler. I'm the chairperson for the Supreme Creek Watershed. I'm representing the RM of Webb. <clears throat> Welcome to the Supreme Creek Watershed's annual general meeting. the 2021 annual general meeting. It's hard to believe this is our third AGM since the pandemic started in the winter of 2020. Here's hoping with spring around the corner, we can put the pandemic as well as a drought that ravaged the prairies last year behind us. We've had two board members step down as the town of Shaunavan and the RM of Lac Pelche have decided to no longer set, send representatives to our board. We'd like to thank Brent Mickelson from Shaunavon and longtime board member Will Legro from the RM of Lac Pelche for their co contributions to the watersheds over the years. <clears throat> Excuse me, we would like to welcome two new members to the board, Alana Howell from the Watershed Authority, she is our technical advisor, and Raymond Perry from the RM of Arlington. Unfortunately, due to funding cuts from the Ministry of Agriculture that assisted with the delivery of the CAP program, we lost our AET technician, Dallas Peters, in April. She had been a long time and valued employee of the watershed. She helped Kevin with lots of projects while still helping producers navigate the CAP program. The loss of an employee like Dallas has put more of a load on Kevin's shoulders as he continues to work on current projects and finds new ones to help meet our mission statement. Also, thanks to Kevin and Bernie Lemire for attending meetings concerning the restructuring of the Saskatchewan Watershed Associations of Watersheds. We're hoping this will aid in the long-term viability of the watershed groups throughout the province. But also like to thank all our current board members for their commitment and guidance to the watershed, as well as our summer stewardship coordinator, Shyla Dyke. She ran the Frog Hoppers program this past year, as well as helping with other projects. So here's hoping we have to wear our rubber boots lots this spring and wishing that everyone has a safe and prosperous year. Thank you. I'll get Kevin to give our Director's report. So I'll just get on some of the highlights in my report. Um, so I guess, you know, if, like everybody, we sort of tried to move along and navigate the pandemic and some of the restrictions. Um, just the ability to work remotely and attend virtual meetings have been helped us quite a bit and have been able to get back to some in person events. So that's helped, but I think this past the drought, as Darren talked about, and everybody's talked about, um, has still put a lot of uh, a lot of the need, you know, highlighted a lot of the need for protecting water quality and watershed health to ensure that everybody has a safe and sustainable supply of water. 
And we've had more, I probably have more inquiries about water levels in the different water bodies and watershed than we had in the last five years combined, um, which has given us a lot of opportunities to educate about, about our watershed, how the water is used and how it's managed within our water. So a good snowpack is, is and runoff is needed to try and get some soil moisture and reservoir levels uh, improved. As Darren mentioned, um, in, the, in April of 2021, the Ministry of Agriculture um, announced that the delivery of the Agri Environmental Technical Services under the Canadian Agriculture Partnership was going to be done solely by, exclusively by MOA personnel and not contracted out to the third party watershed groups. So our contract was not renewed, which ended a 15 year relationship. So this, I, I think this involvement, it's not only the loss of a, uh, of a staff member, which was, you know, which heard quite a bit, but it's also the, this allowed us an opportunity to introduce ourselves to producers and implement beneficial management practices to improve the health of the watershed. Um, as, as Nick was mentioning about fragmentation and the, some of the agriculture practices that have hurt, um, have hurt some of the, the habitat for things like the leopard frog, some of the, some of the beneficial management practices that farmers receive funding for under this program work to improve that habitat, which also then helps the health, health of our watershed. So, um, it, uh, you know, so there's, you know, and, and so there's some, some work there, you know, some good synergy there to try and work with producers to help out the watershed. And it also, as I said, is a bridge sort of between producers and the public to tell the public about what producers have been doing to, uh, Help with the watershed. So, and with the with the that contract ending, unfortunately, Dallas um, moved on to another to take another position, um, staying I guess you know staying in the environmental field. And, and uh, I think she's you know we wish her the best. I think she's doing well. So, uh, we did hire as uh, Darren said, hire Shyla Dyke as our summer stewardship coordinator was able to give a few presentations using the Watershed Wonders kits and helping with uh, water sampling and uh, other summer student related duties. So, and we wish her the best. Um, I think she's heading into Armed Forces training here later this, or maybe already this spring. So a few projects that we finished, the Herbert Water Use and Water Conservation Project. Um, a couple new ones that uh, we continued or we continued on with the Watershed Wonders kits and structures wetland. And 2021 was the first year of the Tree for Life program where we distributed 3,000 trees uh, free of charge to watershed residents. This was a very good project, uh, could have given away a lot more trees. And we will continue with Tree for Life. Uh, trees are, will not be available for free, but they are available to be ordered. Um, I guess just check our website or Facebook page for more information. And I'll touch a bit more on some of our projects later on. Um, and so then we also started identifying uh, grassland fragmentation. Um, fragmentation uh, to improve habitat for species at risk and which will identify cultivated lack of grassland that can be seeded to native grass to improve habitat. And then we're hoping to create a conservation plan. Um, Bernie might touch on this a bit more as we've been working with other watershed, or I guess we've approved, we've working with SAW to uh, undertake a number of projects for 2021, for 2022 and beyond. Um, and just last year or last week, SAW was approved for funding for the On-Farm Climate Change Action Fund, where SAW is partnering with the Manitoba Association of Watersheds on a 40 million project um, that will start. Um, there's a little bit of a difference in my report. We're not starting right away. It's gonna start in April 1st and run to March of 2024. Um, 
and so this project will see will deliver this project to producers to help them implement beneficial management practices to improve carbon sequestration in categories such as nitrogen management, seeding of cover crops, and rotational grazing. It's an exciting opportunity for SAW and, group, and groups like ourselves to increase capacity and further relationships with producers. Um, so SAW and it's, and, or we're examining how to sustain watershed stewardship in Saskatchewan. Uh, many discussions about the future. Um, so I think uh, you know we're still working on that. Bernie will probably touch on it more. Um, we have received assurances that WSA core funding will be provided for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, but no assurances after that. So uh, I guess the time will tell how our reorganization is going, but I'm uh, excited about which way it's going to go. And I think uh, confident that uh, our, our programming will continue and grow in our watershed for sure. Continue with the electronic newsletter, um, trying to get as many names on that uh, as possible. We try to do it monthly, as well as working on the Facebook page. Uh, fortunately, with that, I have to take over the, the duties of running our Facebook page, which uh, for an old guy like me to do that is a little scary, but uh, hopefully I've been able to do it. Um, we try to keep our website current, and Jim Spencer from Prairie Dog Web's website says has, has been uh, working with us on that. Um, fortunate to have interest from the radio stations in the Prairie Coast, and also make um, make good off make presentations to different two different groups. So Southwest Natural, Swift Current Wildlife Federation. Um, Saskatchewan Irrigation Projects Association, and last month we did a webinar for the Prairie Conservation Action Plan Native Speaker Series. So, extend with this, please extend our reach and help inform um, people about the work we do. Financially, 2021 was a good year thanks to our projects. Um, you know, it was allowed us to build some reserve. Um, and we are looking to change our year end from March from March to March from November to better align with government funders just to do more accurate reporting and better budgeting. And I think. So I have again welcome Raymond Perrier, who was from Arlington, who was able to make it today. Um, and I think he represents the Army of Arlington, which is a an important area in the watershed because that's sort of the headwaters uh, of the Swift Current Creek, kind of north of East End and west of Shawnee. And so, I'd just like to give my thanks to the board for their guidance this past year and look forward to working with them in the future. That's my report. Any questions? A few things fairly quickly, but. Thank you. We're going to get this report. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. You want to give you your saw report, Bernie? Maybe just come up here. And, uh, yeah. Switch places. Yeah. Um, just over here. Just because we're switching dollars, I'm going to start the number again. Okay, sure. I mean, the recording's too big. Our old computers don't like it. Okay. Okay, as far as uh, SAR, the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds, we've, uh, Kevin's pretty much touched on all of the uh, projects that SAW has been involved with with Swift Current, um, working more at, at funding. Um, more recent months, SAW has been working on restructuring. Uh, most of you have probably heard about that. Uh, the restructuring is aimed at uh, um, more predictable funding for the for the uh, the groups around the province, more sustainable existence for the watershed groups. Uh, with the loss of the cap funding, uh, most of the groups have lost some some staff, and we don't have predictable predictable funding beyond 23. So 
we had to do something. Uh, all of the water, uh, I guess most of the watershed groups attended the uh, restructuring workshops. Um, it's generally agreed that we will restructure in a fashion that will bring more predictable funding and sustainable funding to the watershed groups around the province. Uh, of course, source water protection and strategies, both quantity and quality is at the root of why we exist. Uh, the Tree for Life project, I guess, did you touch on that, Kevin? Yeah, that's, right yeah, that's going to be implemented again this year. Uh, it was quite successful last year. Also, uh, with restructuring, the we'll be able to more accurately monitor projects throughout all the watersheds and any of the projects that are integrated between the watersheds will be able to be monitored more accurately. So. And of course, that uh, Climate Action Fund that's been recently announced uh, with that's uh, in association with Manitoba Association of Watersheds. Uh, that's a big boost for all the watersheds in Western Canada. And uh, of course, with the uh, with the restrictions around the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, electronic meetings were got to be the norm, although not as successful as in-person meetings. They did help us get through a lot of administration stuff. So, so mostly it's around the, uh, the restructuring for the foreseeable future. Uh, a summary of the two workshops that Kevin and I had attended will be available. Unfortunately, it's not available for today. Uh, March the 3rd is supposed to be supposed to come out, so there will be more accurate reporting on on the results of those workshops when that when that uh, summary does become available. But I'm quite confident that we'll be able to move forward in a very positive fashion with with what's been going on with the restructuring. So I think it'll benefit all the watersheds around the province, and I think we'll benefit here in Swift Creek from the two. And I guess. So that's what all there is for them. Is there anything somebody didn't understand? Did you want to get the yeah? Just touch on some of the project reports here. So, so I guess just to just quickly to go through some of the projects, just to let people know some of the things that we've been working on. Um, last year in 2021 and before that so and what's coming up um so the, the river water use plan and water conservation initiative um this was the last year of this project we collected water samples twice in the spring um, to complete a data set um, to kind of to look at the quality of the water at the system that supplies surface water to the town of Herbert. Um, which is basically high field down um, the Herbert Main Irrigation Canal, uh, a reservoir east of Herbert and a dugout north of Herbert. So it, uh, so what we, we took the water samples, um, put the results together, and compiled it into a final report um, with conclusions about the project and recommendations to the town of Herbert about how to supply high quality water to its residents. Um, for people who don't know, the town of Herbert uses both uh, groundwater, well water, and surface water to uh, supply its residents with water. Uh, um, it uses an RO system in its water treatment plant that uh, there has been problems with the algae that's coming out of the coming from the uh, surface water with the uh, with the ROs, with the filters of the RO system, and also the difference between the two types of water, um, and just the difference in, the, in its makeup and the difference in the temperatures that it's coming into the water treatment plant makes it hard for the water treatment plant to properly treat. So what we had hoped to do with this project was to kind of put together a plan for them to say when to use the surface water, when to use groundwater, and how much of each. Unfortunately, um, 
their groundwater daily supply is limited. So basically the plan is to use as much of the well water as possible and then supplement with groundwater as needed, mostly through the summer. So, um, so that we also have come up with some recommendations for them as well. And, and during this time, the town of Herbert has also implemented several practices to improve its efficiency. So it was a good, um, a good project to look at the, the quality of water in the system that hasn't been studied much and to try and figure out um, how, do you, how to best uh, meet the needs of a pretty unique situation in Herbert because there isn't a lot of places that use that. So there was also an education portion of this project. Um, but it did a lot of articles on water conservation and, and uh, some presentations to youth. Um, the articles were published in the Herbert Herald. So, and like I said, then we did a, a final report with some recommendations. Um, so funding for this project mainly came from the Eco Action Community Fund of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, we also had funding from the town of Herbert for their with this, um, the Herbert Herald for publishing articles, uh, Saskatchewan Research Council for their assistance with water sampling and water security for technical guidance. Uh, the other project that ended up that was completed this year was the testing of phosphorus um in saskatchewan testing for phosphorus in lakes and rivers flowing into the saskatchewan river um this was we worked with uh three other watersheds to collect water samples basically for tributaries flowing into the saskatchewan river um the saskatchewan river as you know event flows eventually ends up going into uh the lake winnipeg basin and the lake winnipeg basin is, is having had lots of issues with algae blooms, eutrophication of the water, things of that nature. And so then this project was just to look and see how does, how is the Saskatchewan River system and its tributaries contributing to that? So we taking took, taking a lot of water samples in different spots um, in the Swiftman Creek watershed, the South Saskatchewan, the North Saskatchewan and the Carrot River. And the other thing that we were looking at in Swift Current is about, about I'll be going on just about five years now, probably four years, is was contacted by, by a researcher who said that this is that the Swift Current Creek is, is contributing way more phosphorus than the water is contributing, which I didn't believe at the time. And our results show that it's that we do not contribute a lot of excess phosphorus into the Saskatchewan River. So um, we kind of, the results show what we've seen in other of our monitoring projects. Phosphorus levels are low below Duncairn Dam, increased because between Duncairn Dam and the city of Swiffer, and then are lower downstream. So, um, so that's, we've finished that. I don't know if there was a report completed. Um, the Kara River Valley Watershed Association was sort of the lead on this project. I'm not sure what they done for a report. So this project was funded again, was funded by the Lake Winnipeg Basin Program of Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, and this Ministry of Ag, uh, Agriculture assisted us with uh, shipping samples for us to the uh, Roy Roman lab. Um, and then, as I said, our partners, South Saskatchewan River Watershed Stewards, North Saskatchewan River Basin Council, and the Carrot River Valley Watershed Association. Um, and then we've touched base about the, um, the the loss of the Canadian Agriculture Partnership Association. We did did complete a few um, a few projects this year, and. Uh, We've had some calls from people who are still thinking that we're we're involved with this, and we I just uh, forward them to the uh, Ag Knowledge Center, the Swift Regional Office, and their numbers are included here. So we still have a fairly um, strong working relationship with the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, 
We collaborated with them last fall on a virtual foraging into the future conference. Um, just on some webinars about uh, about some new forage variety for research and are working with them um, to continue to uh, put on a uh, host a foraging into the future in-person event this fall. So we're still working to um, mitigate the impact of agriculture on, on water quality and watershed health because that was one of the priorities identified by our stakeholders in 2019. So and that's we're doing that through some of our Projects such as the constructed wetland and the identifying native grasslands project. And funding for the Canadian Agriculture Partnership uh, was come through the Canadian Agriculture through uh, the Minister through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, which is a federal uh, and provincial government uh, co-funded program. Our aquatic species and invasive species monitoring and education. So we went out to 15 sites at uh, different lakes and reservoirs in southwest, southwest Saskatchewan. Um, so Duncairn, uh, Lac Belchay, and then we also went to Cypress Lake, uh, Saskatchewan Lining, Beaver Flats, and Herbert Ferry, just because we're the closest watershed group to those areas. So, um, so we we set out uh, samplers to try to detect for the uh, the presence of the adult mussels, and we also took uh, water samples to detect the larval stage of the zebra mussel and also environmental DNA. Um, and as of yet, I have not heard any. We did okay. Sorry, we did not find any adult zebra mussels. And we haven't haven't received the results of either the the uh, Belliger sampling or the eDNA analysis yet. So I'm operating under the uh, impression that no news is good news. They haven't found anything yet. So um, so we just continued education through newsletters and Facebook posts. Um, we can continue to informally monitor for other aquatic invasives such as Prussian carp. Flowering Russian Eurasian milfoil. Um, project funding, funding for this project, excuse me, was supplied by Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds through funding from the Saskatchewan Fish and Wildlife Development Fund and the Invasive Species Council. The, the one of our new project for this year is the identifying and identifying native grassland fragmentation to improve habitat for species. It's a long title or all we're, what, we're, what we're trying to do is to map areas of cropland in proximity to native grasslands and critical habitat for species at risk to try and find those areas where if we seeded native, if we seeded those areas back to native grassland, it would improve the habitat for the species at risk. So as Dr. Karen's talked about, you know, the fragmentation, you know, with, with northern leopard frog fragmentation of habitat, um, you know, being in little bits and pieces is, is a big issue for a lot of the species at risk in our area because they, you know, their evolution, you know, while they come, you know, they they were used to the big tracks of, of native grassland. So um, we're working to try and find these areas that we can see back, get to see back from native grassland to try and improve this, this habitat. Um, we have maps created, we've got maps created in fall and this spring we're gonna be doing surveys and writing a conservation plan to try and, and develop a method to develop a way to uh, convince landowners to uh, to try and see these, try and reestablish native grassland. Because the 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 tie to um, the tie to the watershed stewardship and, and native and reestablishing these. Uh, 
the, the habitat for species at risk is that the more areas that we have with the, the, the better the, the better some of the areas with native grassland, the better the riparian area that it will be, and you know the better it will be able to perform its function. Be less uh, less sanitation, less nutrients, less pollution, and just improved water quality. <coughs> so we'll be doing, like I said, um, doing surveys and creating a plan this summer and hope by you know, um, late fall, early winter to have a conservation plan completed for this. So we're partnering with the South Saskatchewan River Watershed Stewards. Um, as several of the rural municipalities in this project are shared with our, our have land that is both in our watershed and in the South Saskatchewan. And there's also um, some of the areas towards uh, in that leader area, which are also included, are uh, part of this are uh, part of this project. So funding for this project um, was provided by the Habitat Stewardship Program of Environment and Climate Change Canada. The Tree for Life, which Bernie had touched on uh, last year, um, the, the watershed groups in Saskatchewan distributed 27,000 trees. Uh, to be planted to sequester carbon to mitigate impacts of climate change. We distributed 3,000 trees to watershed residents and the response was overwhelming. We could have given away, a, I don't want to say twice, but pretty close. So if we had the supplies. Um, so last year, part of this project was um, to get people to complete survey on climate change and post pictures of their trees on social media. Um, so the survey was designed to get an understanding of Saskatchewan's, the residents' perception of climate change. Um, however, the uptake on the survey was was okay, but was lower than, than the target that we had kind of put into the application. And that was even with the possibility of winning a $500 gift card. Um, I think many residents were probably hesitant to give their thoughts on, you know, the climate change being somewhat controversial, especially for our two main industries, agriculture and oil and gas. So um, the fortunate thing is, is that we were, um, you know, is that uh, I think we've got enough information, enough surveys completed to get the information we require. Uh, so again, you know, the, uh, the local media helped uh, helped us quite a bit uh, to promote this project. Uh, I went out water sampling the morning that the an article the morning that the story about this went on to went on the radio station. Um, Shyla had started yet, so I had my nephew with me helping to do water sampling, and it was a good thing I had him along because he did nothing but write names down. I had phone calls the whole time we were doing. It. Like it was, it didn't take long. I think it was like a minute after the, the story here that we were getting phone calls. So people were excited about the free trees. So funding for this project was through, was from the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds through the Environment and Climate Change Canada's Environmental Damages Fund. We are continuing with the Tree for Life program. Um, as I said, the trees will no longer be free, um, but they will cost $5 per, per trees for, for orders under 250 and for orders of 260 or more, the cost is $350 per tree and you can order directly on the SAW website. So, and I think we do have probably a little bit better selection this year than we did last year. Um, for trees, so I would, I think it's April 1st that everything is done. So, uh, and I know we've, there's, there's been some orders already. So uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of good uptake on it. It's been advertised as a way to help support watershed stewardship in our province. So some of the, you know, some of the funds will, Will help us. Will help saw, and we'll come back to our group as well.
So the Watershed Wonders kits, um, so this is the first year they were in use. Um, so they're basically kits that the, the schools, youth groups, um, and families can use uh, with edu there's education and activities about watershed stewardship that can go out to uh, the, just they go out and they can use. Um, we don't have to uh, have to be there. So it, it's it really was developed as a COVID friendly way to. Uh, Get the word of watershed stewardship out to uh, out to uh, young people. So I think we but we did use the kits for as a basis for presentations with I think there was over 100 students. And I think I've sent the kits out uh, a half a dozen times, and it's been well received. So um, funding for this project was provided by the Water Security Agency Project Incentive Fund and Plains Midstream Canada. Um, constructed wetland is in the flood irrigation uh, projects at Waldeck and Rush Lake. Um, there's a lot of excess water that gets used or that doesn't get used for irrigation. It just kind of runs over the field and uh, it just gets drained somewhat rather than being used for irrigation. Um, at Waldeck, this excess water drains into the Swift Current Creek. And our water quality monitoring shows that water quality is downgraded um, downstream of uh, where the water drains into. And at Rush Lake, the excess water flows into Reed Lake and Morris, which is a dead end saline lake. So that water becomes unusable. So, what we're looking to do with this project is to demonstrate that constructing a wetland on these lots will naturally treat the excess water to improve water quality downstream or make it suitable to be used again for irrigation and other uses uh, to help conserve water to better manage water resource or open new land for irrigation. Um, so last summer we took water samples to set baseline of water quality. Um, so there's not much difference in the water quality water coming in versus going out and that, that Last year, anyways, the excess water could be used for irrigation. Um, so we're hoping to show that maybe the constructed wetland would uh, make it uh, even better for reuse, uh, or maybe even I uh, give a presentation about this to the Saskatchewan Irrigation Projects Association. One of the things that I mentioned to them was being able to reuse it not just for irrigation or other uses, and the example that I gave there was that in Calgary there's a beer company that's advertising that it's making its beer from recycled water from the wastewater from its Calgary wastewater treatment plant. So I mean it could it could potentially be you know with with proper treatment things can just put anything could be done. So um, the wetland at Rush Lake was constructed in November 2021. One of Waldeck could be done this spring. Um, We'll be seeding these wetlands with native species that can handle wet and then dry spells and also remove nutrients and pollutants. This spring we're looking to see just how the impact of having the water sitting in the wetland uh, will affect water quality and our funding for this project ends in March of 2024. And funding for this project is provided by Environment Climate Change Canada's Eco Action Community Fund. Any kind of support comes from WSP for wetland design and construction support and Saskatchewan Research Council for water testing. Is that it? It is. So I would like also to mention I mentioned all of our project funders. I um, would also like to acknowledge that uh, the funding uh, from Water Security Agency, who funds our uh, core operations um, allows for paying, I guess, my salary as well as um, our office rent and uh, some of our operational costs as well. So that's my project report. If there's any questions, I'll do things fairly quickly. Let me get, <coughs> excuse me, get a motion to adopt the report. Reports. Sure. 
Don makes the motion. Uh, Bernie seconds. Oh, is that one question oh, about the uh, invasive aquatic invasives? Uh, is our cold climate uh, part of the reason, perhaps, that these things can't survive well here? Yes, possible. It's not going to be conclusive yet, but that's it's not conclusive yet. But it's it definitely they do not handle it for the most part. Do not handle our handle freezing. So handle cold, but they have have seen them. I think survive in like why like in in the live wells or whatever in boats and stuff. So, sure. uh, but yeah, it's possible that uh, that our cold weather at least breaks the cycle, right? But they are in Manitoba, so uh, <coughs> and Manitoba is you know like the Lake Winnipeg is pretty bad. The other thing that may help us in, in keeping them away is that some research I've seen has shown that they don't like high levels of potassium, which some of our lakes will have because of our potash reserve, you know, will have higher levels of potassium. So that, uh, so that's you know kind of maybe two of the things, but I do know that they do not do not like the cold as much. So hopefully that helps us out. But some of these with some of these invasives, they tend to one of their advantages is they can evolve quickly and adapt to the changes. So on the uh all phosphorus testing that we did show that. A lot of phosphorus is coming from the Saskatchewan River. From yeah. Swiffer, what about the river, the Saskatchewan River? Is it identified? I don't think it is identified. I mean, I haven't seen your other, the other fruit juice salts. Like I said, I don't know if there was a report necessarily put together. Um, I think we're still contributing, but not contributing more than our fair share. So, and I, and I don't think we've seen that. I don't. The other, from little I did see, the other ones are, you know, both the same ones. So it's, it's, it sort of accumulates a little bit as you go farther west, but for east, but it's so not that that's a concern. concern. They're still looking. There's still looking, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's always going to be a concern uh, for like, right? like the nitrogen, you know, like the, the phosphorus levels and yeah, algae. I haven't heard anything, no. I know that Manitoba, I think, where they just announced they're going to be doing more. So I think so. Um, it, it seems to be more of a, you know, the Lake Winnipeg is probably the sort of ground zero for a lot of that, a lot of that uh, allergenic mutation issues. So, any other questions? We had a motion. Uh, yeah. Yes. Need to have a vote to pass. Uh, all in favor? Okay. So we got the uh, financial report. So the financials are in here. I think we're still just sort of a draft. Um, so just to uh, and again the the. Stark and Marsh just made the comment about uh, efficiency of revenues over expend expenditures. Uh, you know that we actually for the year end and ending November 30th showed a loss of 5,500. Um, last year it was a revenue excess of 52,000, and that's due to the receiving the money for the constructed wetland project in November of 2020 and not spending all of the not spending the money until this summer. So uh, I guess just to keep that in mind. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I'm kind of, you know, why we're looking at uh, changing our year end to March to try and um, match, better match our funding received and funding spent to fiscal years. So, um, I guess just going through it on the financial information here. 
until I get run through everything. Um, you know, I've looked at these things, a lot of these things, and still sometimes have trouble figuring out. So I guess we're just looking at it as, on a cash basis as of um, as, as of as of November 30th, 221, $170,000 dollars versus 181 in 2020. So we are, you know, showing you know, both, you know, that sort of reflected in reflects the uh, cash loss as of the end of November 30th. So and then and then again in terms of our funding, uh, water security agency core funding was 74,500. Ministry of Ag, 45,000, which again, um, we received uh, $30,000 in, uh, in the spring to sort of wrap up the, to wrap up our part of the uh, MOA, but that uh, agro-environmental funding. Uh, constructed wetland project, 28,575. Habitat stewardship uh, was 23,063. And then some of our smaller projects. On our expenses, um, the biggest was on on was the constructed wetland. Um, that was to uh, that was to WSP for design as well as for water sampling. And then our salary or wages and benefits um, were quite a bit lower, which was because of the um, because of Dallas uh, leaving or agro environmental technician leaving in uh, May. So leaving us again with debt assets of 178,933. I think we just have a few notes. So I don't know if there's any questions on financial statements. We're still left with a fairly good reserve, um, which would allow us you know, in times of funding uncertainties to to, to allow us to continue to operate and find funding should that be a necessity. I get a motion to adopt the financial report. Frank, is that motion? Second there. Pat. All in favor? Motion's passed. Nomination for reviewer. Yeah, reviewer. So I guess we just need to nominate reviewer. Um, Start in March. We've done it the last two years. They've done a good job with the POS. So my recommendation is to nominate them again. I don't know if I, I can't make that. I'll get somebody. So, I'll make that one. Okay, Frank makes a motion to um, start, start to March for another year. Seconder. Um, just one question. Oh, sorry. It'll be in there. I just didn't see it. What, what are the charges? Well, we haven't got the bill. They charge we about three thousand dollars. Last year was about three grand. And that's a that's a re, that's a financial that's a financial statement compilation. Compile our financials. We don't need we don't need an audit because our our revenues are less than 250, and I think we've kind of said that we're just going with the review kind of things, so the comp or with the compilation of financials at this point. So, okay, right. okay motion okay. Really seconded. Yeah, all in favor, yeah, and just to add to that, our Anybody that are funding, you know, the, the people our main funders have been satisfied with the result of the product that Stark and Marsh has been providing us. So we provided that. 
All right, any new business? Any questions? Any questions from nobody? We've lulled them to sleep, I guess. Yeah. Good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. I have right. nothing new. Yeah, that's new. I'll Sure. Sure. Well, that's good. Then I get a motion to adjourn. Don, accept the motion. Uh, seconds it. All in favor? It's passed. Good. Thanks everybody for yeah. coming out. Thanks to our guests for coming too. And thank you to Caitlin for uh, for providing the the platform. Yeah, they uh, have it on oh, webinar virtual. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Darren. Another one in the books. Another one in the books. Yes. Can you send me the who was on? <laughs> Yes, I can download a list and I'll be yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah.